from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 14th Librarian of Congress, Car Dr. Carla Hayden. Thank you, Michael. I don't know about you, but I am having a great time. Welcome to the Library of Congress National Book Festival, our premier public event. And this is my first book festival officiating. And as you can see, I am pretty thrilled to be here. Now today is our, and it's an honor for me to be able to say our, 16th annual celebration of books and reading. And as you can see from the beautiful art behind me and throughout the convention center, the theme of this year's festival is journeys. Because books really do take us on journeys we might not otherwise ever go on. They make us think about the world we live in and also the one that preceded us. They are our portals into the future. As Thomas Jefferson once said, I cannot live without books. I have been a librarian my entire career, and I could not agree more. And I would take a bet that there are a lot of people in this room who would agree too. I would like to invite a person who has made this festival possible. I am pleased to bring to the stage Mr. David Rubenstein, who will be interviewing our exciting guest and author. I would dare to say that no one cares more about books and literacy than David, and we cannot thank him enough for his support of the National Book Festival every year. And thanks to his generosity, I am able to announce today that the date of next year's National Book Festival will be on Saturday, September 2nd. So mark your calendars. <laughs> David is a wonderful and experienced interviewer, and I know you are looking forward to his conversation for his special guest. I am too, because I get to sit down and listen. Okay, thank you. So, the country is uh, very fortunate to have a uh, Library of Congress from my hometown of Baltimore. And uh, for several hundred years, we managed never to have a female uh, Library of Congress. That's now been corrected. Uh, And for several hundred years, we never had a person of color serve as Librarian of Congress. That's now been corrected. So, uh, Carla, everybody is looking forward to your tenure, and congratulations on this position, and thank you very much for taking this position. So, um, we have a special treat uh, today. Uh, somebody who is, I would say, the most dominant person on, in television. Uh, sh what she has done is something that uh, nobody has done really before. Um, now, in a profession that is typically dominated by white males, she has been the dominant figure, and that is in television production and creation and writing. And she has written more uh, top television uh, shows and produce more top te television shows than anybody uh, currently, anybody in history. Uh, Shonda Rhimes is a person who grew up in Chicago, went to Dartmouth, went to the University of Southern California, and then began writing screenplays uh, for movies, and then ultimately came up with a little bit of an idea called Grey's Anatomy. And, and that was in 2005, and the rest is history. So. Uh, she's an extraordinary person in other respects as well. Not only is she a dominant figure in television now, but she's an incredible mother to her three children. She's also a great philanthropist. She just came from the African American History and Culture Museum where she donated $10 million. So, 
and I have the pleasure of having her serve on the Kennedy Center Board of Trustees, appointed by President Obama. So it's my pleasure to welcome Shonda Rhimes. Okay, thank you. All right, great, thank you very much. All right, which side, either side? Okay, okay, fine. So. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. And um, let's start by asking you an obvious question. This is a profession, the one that you're in, that has been dominated, as I said at the beginning, by white men. So has it been harder to do what you've done being a woman or being a person of color? That's an interesting question, actually. I don't know that I know the answer to that because I haven't been anything but a woman and a person of color. Okay, all right. And to me, neither one of those things is hard because they've always been there. Um, that's just who I am. I don't consider them barriers or burdens. I consider them assets. Okay. So, uh, right now, you have uh, on television right now four series, is that correct? Four right now? This season, four of my series will air, yes. So, let's see. It would be Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. Um, right, how to Get Away with Murder. Catch. Those are on. Those are on this fall. Um, in the spring, well, in January, because of maternity leave, we're going to do um, Scandal. And, right, okay. And The Catch will come on again. So, yeah. All right, so um, you're, you're doing that. You have three children. You have lots of other responsibilities. You have phil philanthropic uh, uh, responsibilities. Um, have you ever thought of cutting back and just <laughs> taking life a little easier? I, I think about it a lot, um, but I really love my job and I love what I do, and it's working right now. Everything is working. If it wasn't working, I wouldn't be doing it. If it didn't feel right and I wasn't enjoying my life, I would find some way to cut back. I've also, just this year, figured out how to delegate even more. I <laughs> hired a lot more staff to do a bunch of things that I thought had to be my job. And it turns out that there are actual full-time jobs for other people. Right. All right. <laughs> so uh, let's talk about your background a moment. So you grew up in the uh, Chicago area. Yes. And your parents, uh, your mother was a university administrator, your father was a college professor? Flip that. Flip. The my, other way around. My mother's a university professor, professor. my father is a okay. college administrator. And you have um, a, a fair number of siblings? I'm the youngest of six. Youngest of six. Okay. So it was a very happy family. Yes. So very often, when people go into great success in Hollywood or in show business, they have tortured backgrounds, yes. which they love to talk about and, and talk to their psychiatrists about them and so forth. So, but you had a loving family, you had two uh, parents who were very nurturing and well-educated and, and provided a good income for the family. So where did you get your motivation? I don't know. I mean, they're... they're... <laughs> I don't think the idea that you must be damaged in order to be creative in Hollywood is true. Okay. Um, I also just don't serve, I don't, I don't know, I don't jump on the train that being damaged is cool or hot or interesting or, I don't know, creative, serves a creative purpose. I'm an optimistic person. I'm happy. Okay. I like what I do. Right, so you, you grew up in the Chicago area, it's a big urban kind of area, and then you... I grew up in the suburbs. Suburb. Yeah. But uh, you, you chose to go to college uh, at Dartmouth, which is an excellent school, but it's a little isolated compared to Chicago, you might say. Yeah. So how did you happen to pick Dartmouth as a place you wanted to go to college? I have very overprotective parents, and when it was time to pick colleges, I said I wanted to go to school in New York, I said I wanted to go to school in Paris, I said I wanted to school in, go to school in New, um, San Francisco, LA, and my parents said you're not going to school in a big city, like that's not happening. And they were right, like I was a very naive 16 year old girl who would have been dead in a week. Right. Like, I just didn't know anything about the world. And when I went to look at colleges that weren't in big cities, um, Hanover, New Hampshire was beautiful and it was small and everybody was very welcoming and despite its reputation for being very conservative, actually turned out to be a fairly liberal, cool right. place. Right, so when you were there, you were involved in uh, the, the campus theater, and you were also involved in the student newspaper? Yeah, I wrote a little bit for the student newspaper. Mostly I wrote, I was in the theater department. 
And did you realize then, when you looked at all the other people, that you were a slightly better writer than other people? <laughs> no? You, you can be honest. I, I've known I was a writer since I was three years old, and I've known I was good at it since I was... I mean, I could hold people with a story since I was a very small child. That was not a thing that felt new or surprising or like okay. a discovery. I truly... Okay. It was like sitting down at a piano and learning that you always knew how to play. That's one thing that I've always been lucky about. So people who are good writers um, uh, often go into writing professions. You went into one after college, the advertising world. So you were yes. writing scripts, I guess, for ads or something like that? Mostly I was a receptionist. Receptionist, I mean, it was the, okay. Lowest, okay. the lowest job on the totem pole. All right, you were thinking about being yes. a writer. Okay. So what propelled you to get out of being that and going to the University of Southern California to go into uh, a fine arts school? I really wanted to be a writer. My parents did not want me to waste all of the money they'd spent on an Ivy League education. And so they really wanted me to go to graduate school. And, you know, law school, medical school, get a PhD in something. And I read an article in the New York Times that said it was harder to get into USC film school than it was to get into Harvard Law School. And so I thought, well, they can't say it's a bad thing because it's harder to get into than Harvard Law School. So I applied, and I got in, and I went. Okay. That and was about as much thought as I gave it. And you didn't miss, you didn't miss not going to law school, right? No, I no. did not miss it at all. So um, when you were there, you got your degree, and then uh, after you got your degree, you started doing screenplays mm -hmm. for uh, motion pictures? Yes. Um, I wrote... Um, you know, you, you star for a while, you work as an assistant for a while, and then I got a job, I spilled a spec script, and I got a job, and I wrote um, Introducing Dorothy Dandridge, which was the movie starring Halle Berry, which is on HBO. Okay. And then you star for a while longer, and I um, did a lot of movie rewriting and stuff like that, and then I wrote um, Crossroads, starring Britney Spears. Right. Yes. But what was that like to work with Britney Spears? You know what? It was probably one of the most fun experiences I've ever had in my life. Because it was literally, somebody turned to me one day and said, do you want to write a movie with Britney Spears? And like two days later, I was on a plane sitting backstage at one of her concerts talking to her about a movie. And she was, she was 17. Like it oh. was, she was the biggest pop star in the world at the time. It was fascinating. So, did anybody say, have you ever written a screenplay before, or they didn't ask you if they ever done it before? Or? Oh, no, I mean, I had. I mean, yeah. I've been writing movies, but it was mostly just the experience of writing something completely different in a completely different okay. world. So, how did the idea for going into television arise when you started Grey's Anatomy? Um, I'd become a mother, and the thing that nobody tells you when you become a mother is that you're no longer allowed to leave the house. <laughs> um, really. So, literally, I went from this life where I was going out all the time and hanging out with my friends to, you know, it's illegal to leave your baby at home by themselves. <laughs> so, I was home with my kid, and I started watching a ton of television. And it was right at the time, like, Buffy the Vampire Slayer was on, and 24 was on, and there were all these shows that were on that you could watch thousands of episodes at a time, it felt like. So, I watched an entire season of 24 and 24 hours. And I watched, you know, an entire season of Buffy. And it occurred to me that that's where all the character development was happening. Because after Crossroads, and bless its heart, I mean, it really did a lot for me. I was writing a lot of teen girl movies, which were fun and served a purpose, but movies weren't allowing for a lot of character development. You know, you got to have a makeover sequence, and there'd be a montage, and then they wanted the movie to stop. I wanted to figure out how those girls grew up or what happened to them later, or what the darker parts were. Always. And those things always got cut out. And in writing television, I realized you could tell a story and it could go on forever. Okay, so you were starting to write uh, Grey's Anatomy, but how did you wind up being the producer of it as well? Because usually writers are writers and not producers necessarily. In television, that's the other good thing about film versus TV. In film, um, the writer has absolutely no power, I like to say. The director fires the writer. In television, the writer fires the director. Right. Um, in television, the writer is the producer, okay. always. There's never a world in which the writer is not the producer. If you create your television show, you are generally a producer of your television show. And if your agent and lawyer are smart, you're the executive producer of your television show. Right. 
So when Grey's Anatomy first went on, uh, when did you realize it was going to be a, a big hit? I'm going to be honest, and it's going to sound crazy, but probably about season five. Season five. I'm not kidding. Because I was in the bubble of working so hard, it took a really long time for it to sink in that it was different from other shows or that the zeitgeist was different. We were all sort of working inside the bubble of what the show was. It felt different around season three, but until then, none of us were paying attention. So do you get doctors calling you all the time saying, well, I have a good idea for you, or this wasn't accurate, or this? We have a team of surgeons who consult with our shows. We have doctors who write on our staff. We have um, surgical nurses who help us create our surgeries. So we have all these LA doctors sort of around us and doctors from all over the world. We also have people who, you know, we talk to from like the NIH or the CDC who are like willing to help give us research. So we try really hard to be accurate because we, there's a study that says like 75% of the medical knowledge that people get, they get from television programs. Wow. And that's a terrifying thing. Like it feels very wow. much like a giant responsibility. Well, when you meet, when you have all these doctors, you ever say to them, well, I have a headache or I have this, what would you yes. recommend? Yes. So our, our doctor writers on staff, I feel like, um, are tired of treating me right. and, and my children. So having one uh, hit on TV is a pretty big deal, but then what propelled you to have a second uh, show and where did that idea come from? Um, the second show came from fear, really. Uh, I created private practice because I was afraid that Grey's Anatomy was going to get canceled and then I wouldn't have a job. And really, like, the first thing that happens to you when you become successful is you become terrified that that success is gonna go away. Like it felt like this is too good to be true, this felt like way too easy, like something's wrong, they're fooling me somehow. I was like, I have to make another show so that I have some, a backup. That's really what it felt like. Um, and so private practice came out of that. The network wanted a spin-off, I was like, I will give them one. This will be my job security. And so in season three of Grey's Anatomy, very foolishly, I planned a spin-off. And I say foolishly because I had no idea what two shows at a time was going to be like. What was it like? You're doing two different jobs? And... Um, doing two shows at the same time when I had just learned how to do one, because I'd never worked in TV when I started Grey's, was like being run over with a car twice a day, every day. Right. I mean, it was brutal. And the only thing that saved me that first season was, and this is terrible because everybody lost their jobs, was the writers went on strike. So there was a giant writer strike, and all work stopped in Hollywood. And if all work had not stopped in Hollywood, I'm telling you, I would be working at the Library of Congress right now, okay. happily shelving books somewhere. So, when I was growing up, there was a show, you're too young to remember this, called The Dick Van Dyke Show. Oh, yeah. Right? And that was basically about a script writers for a television show. Yeah. And they just sat around and kind of came up with ideas and so forth. And how does it actually work? Do you sit around with a couple of people, come up with ideas, or one person goes home and, and home, goes home and writes it, or how does it work? I think it depends on the show. Um, I treat Grey's very differently than I treat Scandal, just because of the kind of show it is. Grey's, you know, we sit in a room, we talk about ideas. I am, at this point, I am the storyteller of that show more than anything else. I can walk in the room and I sit down and I say, here's what happens next. Here's what the episode's about. Here's where all the characters are. And I have writers who've been on that show for so long that then they write the episodes. So, in other words, you come up with the ideas and then they kind of fill in the... I have to say what happens next or right. else nobody knows what happens next, but they can write the show and then I give tweaks and rewrites and it's small but we're in season 13. But suppose you don't like a particular actor or actress, can you just write them out pretty easily? Does that happen? Or... <laughs> I suppose, but that's not really what happens. Right. I mean, it's interesting. You fall in love with your characters. And I have learned really, really, um, I learned really early on to not hire people that I did not want to spend a lot of time with. It's a very interesting thing, and this, and this is rare and weird to have a, sh to, I've never had a show that's been on the air less than six seasons. That means that I've been working with, anybody I work with, I work with for at least six seasons. That's a family. I mean, that's going to work with somebody day in, day out, intimately for a really long time. You better like them. You know, and I think it's interesting that, you know, people think like, oh, you didn't like this person. You didn't. I was like, how could I not like them? I've been with them forever. So you have to like them.
But how do you deal with the business aspects? So suppose you like somebody, but that person has an agent who says, well, you really need to like me even more, or... <laughs> you know, there's, I think there's a lot of reasons why people exit, you know, or, or want to be done, or negotiations fail, right. you know, like all those things happen. Then you have to get creative. You know, every year I would ask Sandra Oh, like, is this your year? Is this your year? Just because she's such a phenomenal actress. And you can feel somebody getting a little bit restless. And I kept thinking every year, I can't believe I have Sandra Oh on this show. Like, one day she's going to say she's going to quit. Like, one day. And finally in season 10, she said, I think this is my final season. So you have to figure it out. To figure out what you're going to do and how to exit somebody in a way that feels right for their character. Well, let's talk about a book you've written. Um, this is a National Book Festival. Yes. So um, you wrote a book uh, called The Year of Yes. Yes. And where did that title come from? Um, my sister, who is in here somewhere, I don't know where she is. There right she here? is. OK. Um, I have uh, this oldest sister named Dolores, who's not old, but she's my oldest sister, um, who is amazing, and, but very bossy. And <laughs> one day, I think it was Thanksgiving Day, I was listing for her all of these reasons, all these invitations I had, all these fancy invitations I had to go to like all of these amazing places. I, you know, I'd been invited here, I'd been invited there, this party, this event, this speaking engagement. And my sister was sort of listening and finally she said, are you going to say yes to any of these things? And I said, no, obviously. And she, <laughs> and she listened to me give all my reasons why I work, had work, I had kids, I had things. And she said, you know, you never say yes to anything. And I was really offended. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized she was absolutely right. I never said yes to any invitation I got. I never said yes to anything that made me feel uncomfortable or nervous. I was a fairly shy person. The idea of doing something like this would have given me like a panic attack. I mean, there's so many people in this room right now. Right. Um, and, and so I thought, I'm gonna give myself one year where I say yes to all the things that scare me, not crazy things, but the things that okay. other people do that I think are terrifying. Well, the year you're writing about is 2014. Yes. And in that year, you're asked to give the commencement address at Dartmouth, your yeah. alma mater. So normally you would have said... No. But this year... <laughs> yeah. This, that year you said yes. And how terrifying was it to prepare that speech? Um, it was so terrifying that I didn't prepare the speech, I think, until about seven or eight days before I had to go and give the speech, and then I chopped it up and rewrote it on the plane on the way there. Like, I avoided it deeply, because I was just frightened to death about the concept of it. So it worked out okay? It did, mainly because I realized that the only way to do it was to just get up there and not try to give a speech, to just okay. tell the truth, to tell them whatever it was that I would have wanted to hear when I was graduating from college. Well, talk about writing the book. Uh, if you're, you're overseeing four TV shows mm -hmm. and you have three children and you have other responsibilities, how did you have time to actually write the book? When did you do that? I didn't have a lot of time. I, um, I wrote a lot at 5 o'clock in the morning. I, would, I got up early at 5 a.m. and I write from 5 to 7 before the kids got up. I tried to do that a lot. That was actually really productive. What I mostly did, though, was... I think <laughs> three weeks before the book was due, I went away and I wrote like mad, um, which was the best thing for me to just sit down and get everything out and fix and hone and make right. all the notes that I'd written perfect and do all the real work. Now, sometimes famous people um, like you have people who are collaborators on books because, um, you know, they don't have time. <laughs> But if you're a writer, you can't have a collaborator because that's what you do. So you had yeah. to write this book, right? Yeah, it wouldn't have even occurred to me. Right. Okay. So it took you how long to actually write it? I'm a, I'm a fast writer. I don't like to say because I don't want my publisher to know how long it takes me to write a book. Because okay. okay. then they'll expect the books to be right. faster. They'll, okay. Yeah. And when you write, um, some people uh, write longhand. Some people use a computer. What do you, how do you do it? Yeah, I write on my laptop with my headphones on, and that's all I need. All right, and so then you edit it over and over and over again, or how do you do that? No, I'm like a first, second draft person, and then I'm done. Okay. So when the book came out, um, you had to do book tours, I guess, or did you some? Yeah. So was that terrifying to do that, or you didn't mind doing that? That was also um, 
it was a really new experience and it was a little bit of a shock to the system just being that public it was also just the realization that I had written this very very personal thing and the only way I had written it was thinking nobody was ever going to read it and then suddenly it was in print and I was going to go meet a bunch of people who had read all these personal things about me um, that was terrifying but it actually turned out to be wonderful because I kept meeting people who would tell me stories about things that they had read in the book and how it had encouraged them to do something and suddenly it didn't feel as terrifying anymore. So I've read the book, of course, and I think I highly recommend it. It's a, a very pleasurable read. The problem with it is that uh, it's hard to put it down and so you need a couple hours or so, but you know, allocate the time. It's a very uh, good book. One of the things in there that was very personal that you obviously wrote about, you said at one point you lost 100 plus pounds. I did. 127 or something like that? Yeah, that year I did, yeah. So, um, what's the secret to losing 127 pounds for those of us who want to lose some weight? This is, I think this is the worst, like I think everybody hates this, but the secret to, to it was literally realizing that it sucked and that I was never going to enjoy it and that there was never going to be a time that I didn't want to eat the fried chicken and that I was always going to be hungry and that it was, no, there's nothing fun about it. I think I always expected like there was going to be some magical moment when I was going to really love running and that salads were going to taste amazing and I was going to prefer being a vegan or something. That's never going to happen to me. Like I'm always going to want the fried chicken. I'm always going to want to lay down. I'm always going to want to eat the brownie. And as long as I can accept that, then I can go, oh, it's not supposed to be easy or fun. I don't quit because you know it's supposed to be work. And if you want it, then you do it. And if you don't, then you don't. So it got that simple. All right. So, okay. So um, you describe in the book that you decided to be a single parent and you have three children. Mm -hmm. And so being a single parent with three children is uh, not easy. No. And um, you have your career and so forth. So you describe in the book something very uh, poignant where you say one time you're going out to an event, you have your gown on, and uh, one of your children says, want to play. Yeah. What did, what did that mean, you want to play? Um, yeah, I have this, um, she's older now, but Emmy was, I think, two, and I, we used to call her the Southern waitress because she called everybody honey. Like, honey, I need some milk in my sippy cup. Honey, I need my diaper changed. <laughs> and one day she said, I was leaving and she said, Mom, I want to play. And I was going to say no. And I realized that A, I was supposed to be saying yes to everything. And B, she was not calling everybody honey anymore. And I had missed the moment when she'd stopped calling everybody honey. And I had been so busy going out the door that, you know, work, running to work and running to this to running to that, that like I was missing her life. And it sort of stopped me cold. And so I made a pact with myself that as much as possible, and I'm not perfect at it by any stretch of the imagination, that whenever my kid said, want to play, I would drop what I was doing and play. And it sounds really beautiful and really like I'm Mother Teresa, but <laughs> kids only want to play with you for about 15 minutes before they lose interest in you. Right. <laughs> so you get to feel amazing, and they all know that you will give them their, your attention but you don't have to, it's not like you're killing your whole life and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, like you can do that, but I have to go to work. It works. So in your book, you also describe a time when you have this very busy job and one of your children's teachers says uh, the children should bring in homemade cookies. Can you explain the difficulty of making cookies while you have all these other things? Yeah, yeah, and this is, you know, the mommy wars are something that I think really have to go away because there shouldn't be any. But it was, I will never forget, there really shouldn't. There's no reason why people should be at war. But I really clearly remember the moment of sitting in that meeting and listening to the very lovely mother standing at the front of the room who said, now all the bake sales are going to happen every Friday and when it's your turn, the desserts must be home-baked with your child. And I just remember like an expletive coming out of my mouth that was very loud and very inappropriate for, for those kinds of meetings. And being furious at it, not just for me, but for like anybody else 
who A, does not bake anything, and B, does not have time to bake stuff. Like, you, you know, if you're going to work and you don't cook, and you, the idea that, like, I'm now a bad person because I'm not going to bake brownies with my kid was really upsetting because that was the implied message. Now, for her, that might have been fine, and maybe she'd never thought of it, but for me, that suddenly made me feel like a terrible person. And, you know, screw her for making me feel that way. But also, like, the conversation around it then goes, like, the mothers who stay at home versus the mothers who work, and it shouldn't be that conversation. So I just kind of felt like my brownies are always going to be in, like, some cheap plastic bag because I bought them at the supermarket, and they're going to come in, like, the paper package, and they're going to have, like, the price tag on them because that's where my brownies come from. And yours will be beautifully home-baked, and they'll have, like, little bows on them, and I will be jealous and want to eat them, so I will not judge you for them, but I'm not going to make them. So, um, now that you're, you're, you're very well known, obviously, in, around the country and so forth, uh, when you get to be famous, do you have people from high school who call you up and say, I knew you were going to be famous, and by the way, can you contribute to this, and can you hire me, or can you do this? you get a lot of that? A lot of people find you again, yeah. Yes. Okay. And your Dartmouth classmates, they always say they knew you were going to be successful? The beauty of having been a very introverted nerd who wore Coke bottle thick glasses and spent 90% of her time reading and most of her time with her sisters is most of the people who contact me couldn't possibly have ever known me at all. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, well, some people do know you have uh, a number of siblings, so yes. is it awkward being, you know, a very, very famous person with siblings who are presumably talented but not quite as famous, or is that not awkward? It's not awkward for me, um, right. and I don't think it's awkward for them because they're not impressed by me in any way, shape, or form. Right. I mean, that, I think that's kind of both incredibly frustrating for me because I'm like, I'm somebody, and they think, no, you're not interesting at all. But it's also wonderful to be surrounded by people who are not interested in any of that stuff. So, like your parents? Yeah, my parents don't care. They love me, but they don't but care. They, but they don't say, well, you know, can you do something for us? Or they don't do anything, they don't ask for no, anything. Oh, God. Nothing. My parents my parents are exactly the same people that they have been our entire lives. But they call and say, don't do this or don't do that, and you still listen to them? or Yeah. My parents are in charge. So um, now that you have this well-established career, all right, so how do you do what everybody wants to do in professional careers, top what you're doing? How can you do more than you're doing? What, what is the next vista that you could possibly accomplish or achieve? You know, it's interesting when you become very proficient at the thing that you have been working so hard at. You know, my producing partner, Betsy Beers, and I talk a lot about the fact that now when t problems crop up with our shows and we're producing things or I'm writing something, there's no struggle, there's no angst of like, what are we going to do? We know what to do now. When you become very proficient and you start looking for other ways to excite yourself, the best way to do it is to think not just what will excite me, because you stop looking inward, you stop looking at like what's going to work for me. I start looking at like how can I take what I know and make stuff happen for other people. So part of it is making it possible for other writers to have shows, how to bring up the next generation of women of color showrunners or women showrunners in general. That's been really important. You know, really helping to raise that generation because the guys aren't doing it. Um, but also, what else can I do that's interesting and exciting and going to give something to the world because there's not much else I need to give no. to myself. How much stuff do you need? So, um, Oprah Winfrey has her own network. Uh, have you ever thought of having your own network? I guess it's called ABC, but... <laughs> no, I do not want my own network. So Oprah has that covered. And you wouldn't uh, go into screenwriting again for movies because television is better for what you like? No, I mean, now I probably would be both producing and writing whatever I did for screenwriting. So I mean, maybe, but I, there's nothing I want to do right now. So you live in Los Angeles, and obviously a lot of people in Los Angeles who are in the uh, show business world who often make a lot of money, um, they have it, found it difficult to not uh, spoil their children. In fact, wealthy people everywhere have that dilemma. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with, um, you know, you've obviously made some money. How do you deal with uh, not spoiling your children? How do you deal with that? I'm working really hard at it, and it's, 
it's a, it's a struggle. I think it's a struggle no matter what, because your child either thinks, like my, my daughter thinks that she is being abused at this point. You know, she's like, what do you mean I can't have? And I'm like, when I was your age, I got $3 for allowance and I earned it this way. And their friends don't have to do anything to earn any money and their friends don't have to do anything to understand the value of money. And to me, it's really important that they understand that. It's really important that they don't grow up thinking that money is just available. Because if you don't know how to work for it and you don't appreciate the value of it, who are you? Like, what, what do you have? So um, your children are now uh, of the age where they are less dependent on you, so they, they, when they go out, you check on everywhere they go? Do you, they... One of them is. I have a 14-year-old, a 4-year-old, and a 3-year-old. So. But you wouldn't let the 14-year-old go to a party and the boy no. or something like no, that? No, she doesn't right? get that to go anywhere. not going to no. happen. <laughs> no. No. And um, as you think of ideas for scripts, I once mentioned to you that maybe you could do a script about the uh, importance of private equity people. Yes. Um, and uh, do I a script about private equity. Private equity uh, yeah, show, that's yeah. not appealing, I guess. You don't see any... Uh... I'm still thinking about right, it. Okay, yes. all right. Okay. <laughs> so today, um, you are a more public person than you used to be. You, as you point out in your book, you were pretty shy. Yeah. Um, but now you're willing to go on television shows, and how terrifying is that? And does it take away from your being able to write and oversee the scripts and the shows? Part of accepting the popularity of the shows and part of accepting the reach that the shows have right. internationally um, with young women, with women of color, was accepting the idea that I am a brand, which was creepy to me at first. But then when you start to realize that the sight of you makes it possible for somebody else to think that they can do something, it makes it feel less terrifying for you to stand up and say, this is what I do. So your shows, I just mentioned, are popular outside the United States as well. Yeah. Is, is uh, international as big in a market as U.S. for television shows or almost as big? Um, I think our shows are in, I want to say, 56 territories, 172 languages, or 172 languages in 56 territories. I can't remember which one. But it's huge. Do you go overseas to promote them, or you just don't do that? Yeah. I'm about to actually go overseas next month. But yeah, you, you do go overseas to promote them and we send a lot of the actors overseas. They're very, like Italy stops on Mondays, I think for Grey's Anatomy, like literally just stops on Mondays. Uh, and it's exciting to hear that um, the continent of Africa loves scandal. Right. You know, like it's, it's really cool to discover right. where the shows are popular and why. Talk about a show, when, you, when a show that is on, a, let's say it's a half hour, an hour show, how long does it actually take to shoot that show? Do you do, does it take a week or does it take a, two um, weeks? Or? Nine days. Nine days. Nine days. And the actors are given the script in advance and they memorize it more or less. Mm -hmm. And so you do one or two takes or more? Yeah, I mean, I think they probably shoot six pages a day. And Five to six pages a day. And if an actor says, well, you know, I know you're a great writer, but I think this would be a better line, what do you say to the actor? Did he ever come? says that. What? <laughs> they don't, and I don't mean that in some... They don't ever the, come the, up with better lines. Sort of the lines. emotional contract that we have is that here is the script, and then I'm so excited to see however you decide to bring it back to me. Like, I can't wait to see the film. But I don't tell anybody how to act, and nobody tells us what the writing should be. Because I feel like that's... Like, it's text, and then your acting is, is, sac it is you know, sacred. So however you do it. And filming, you never film in front of an audience, right? No, because although we did, we did make one comedy pilot last year, and that was actually really fun, and we might do that again. So when you um, have as much success as you have, you obviously make some money. Do you actually get involved in the business aspects of television as well, or do you mostly focus on the creative aspects? No, I really learned early on that there was a a reason and a need to understand the business side. You really have to be a business person. And part of the thing I'm most proud of being of somebody who is fairly shy was that I sat down and learned the business parts, the leadership parts, the parts that weren't easy for me. Because I can sit and write all day in a corner and let somebody else take care of all that other stuff, but I worked really hard to be a businesswoman and understand that stuff.
You know, sometimes writers say that they get ideas from their dreams or something like that. Where do your ideas come from? You just from you read, you just with inspiration. How, you obviously didn't like the private equity idea, but uh, is, uh, where do you get your ideas from? If we probably if we talked long enough, right. I could probably come up with a private equity. Okay, show out all of right, well. But it's, it's not that they come from my dreams, and it's not that I can say exactly where they come from, because they come from everywhere or anywhere. And if I knew exactly where they came from or how to explain it, then I probably would bottle it and start giving seminars on it and never write again or something and make a billion dollars. I don't know where they come from. Okay. You just know when they're good. So I mentioned earlier that uh, you're in town in part because of the African American History and Culture Museum's opening, and you are one of the largest donors to it. So why did you? So um, why did you decide to make that very large gift, and uh, how important was it to be there today? Um, it was really important to be here today. You know. Um, David gave a speech the other night at the Kennedy Center, and you used the phrase, which I thought was really lovely, called, and you, you called it cultural patriotism. Donating to um, a museum is cultural patriotism. And part of the reason why I was so moved to donate and really wanted to be a part of it was the idea of providing the American people with a chance to understand that piece of history to, and to be part of that, to be part of that legacy, felt important to me and that I mean it, it's you know it's a, not a small thing for me I'm not like Bill Gates or something but to be able to do that and to to say to my children and say we helped give this to the American people felt important and it felt like they could then have that pride of I mean from where my grandparents came to to where my children are going to be is unimaginable when you really think about where we are in American history. Like that leap is unimaginable and that felt like it should be for a lot of people, for a lot of children, made possible. So when you explain... <laughs> so like in talking to your children, if you say I just gave 10 million dollars to this museum and they would say, well why can't I have a little money for this or that, they understand the difference, right? She actually did say, and I can't have nicer shoes. Um, then we had a long conversation. Like, I literally, I said, now we're going to sit down because you asked for nicer shoes. Now you get to have a three-hour conversation with me about African-American history. Uh, okay. Yeah. So um, you're very young to be this uh, senior in uh, prominent in the television world. So what would you like to do over the next 10 years? Would it be have more shows or to um, create a network? Or what, what do you think you would like to do ten, be 10 years from today? Where would you like to be? I think about this a lot, and I don't know that I am ready to say the answer, because then my bosses at ABC might have a heart attack. But I do, while I do want to continue to write television, and I love it, and I do really, I mean, writing the book was a really wonderful experience for me. I loved that so much that I really want to do that more. Part of what I want to do is simply expand um, what we are able to make available to what I call the citizens of Shondaland, the kind of people and women and the audience of people who like to watch our shows, who are drawn to the kind of stories we like to tell. I don't think it necessarily has to be just Thursday night in TV. I think there can be other things that are available that we make available to them. So how do you deal with the... Uh the issues of fame, let's suppose you want to go to a restaurant in Hollywood or Los Angeles, do people come up to you for autographs or selfies all the time? How do you deal with not being bothered all the time because you're pretty famous? In LA, it's fine because there's always somebody 50,000 times more famous than me in Los Angeles. I mean, it's when you go someplace else, which I think is interesting. It's when you're in DC or when you're in Chicago or when you're in, I don't know where else. That's, that's the place where you most meet people who are not used to seeing people who they might know who they are. In LA, nobody cares about anybody. Um, most of the time, I am just excited to hear that somebody's watching the shows, and which one and why, because everybody always has one show that they're addicted to, and they don't watch the other ones, and they want to tell me why they don't watch the other ones, and why they watch that particular one. Right. And if it's a guy, he always says, I watch Grey's Anatomy with my daughter 
and that's how we bonded, and now she's at college, and now my heart is broken. Every time. And it's beautiful. Right. Um, but it's wonderful to hear all of the stories about what people like and why they like it. And while you met with the president and the first lady, did they watch your shows? Did they mention that when you were at the White House the other day? <laughs> no, they, they don't want to tell what their TV habits are. I'm not going to say. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, today, um, as you look at this audience, you obviously can see people are very enamored uh, with uh, what you've written. And uh, is the greatest pleasure making other people happy? Is it telling a story? Is it, um, you know, just showing what you can do with your intellect? What, what is the greatest pleasure you now get from what you're doing? I think it's, it, it's telling a story and discovering the connection. It's the idea that you write a story and somebody comes up and says, I felt that too. And it, not just that it connects them to me, the idea that like I'm not alone in my weird thought that I had, but that it means that these two people over there, they're not alone either. Like the two of them aren't alone and those two people aren't alone. The idea that the stuff that I write means that the, the things that make us think that we're all, I don't know, quirky or alone or, or individual and we're the things we're not supposed to be able to think are thought by so many of us and therefore that makes us a community. So you're obviously a role model for many uh, funny people, but let's suppose you're a young uh, college student who wants to be a writer. Uh, what advice would you give to that college student, uh, male, female, white, non-white, about how to be a writer and work your way up the, the totem pole? The advice I always give is that if you're not writing every single day, you are not allowed to call yourself a writer. So a writer writes. So it's really hard for me whenever I meet anybody and they say, I'm a writer too. And then I say, what have you written? And they, don't, they haven't written anything. You have to be writing every day. It's a muscle that you have to exercise. And that's how it gets better and better and better. And you have to practice it to be able to access the place where the creativity comes faster. So to me, my best piece of advice is write every day, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether you have a good day of writing or a terrible day of writing, write something every day. So if you could meet any great writer ever, who would you like to have met or meet? If you could have dinner with anybody, would it be Shakespeare or Milton or any writer that you, you actually admire? I got to have dinner with Toni Morrison already, and that was pretty much it for me. So um, this is a National Book Festival, and a lot of people here want to be writers, but a lot of people are readers. So did you do a lot of reading when you were younger, and you do, do a lot of reading? What kind of books do you like to read? Um, I did a ton of reading, and I probably, I'd read almost anything. I mean, in the sense that I just love stories. I read every, I mean, I've read every Stephen King novel ever written. I've read um, every Shakespeare play ever written. I used to love John Irving. I loved Alice Walker when I was young. The best thing I think my parents did for me was my mother used to march down to the library and yell at the librarian because the librarian would try to tell me that I was too young to take out some of these books. And my parents had a rule that if I wanted to read the book, I could read it. It didn't matter what it was. So I'd be like an eight-year-old kid coming up to her with the French lieutenant's woman going, Mommy, what's a whore? And my mother would be like, there's the dictionary. <laughs> but what was great about it was I felt free to read anything. And it made me hungrier and hungrier and hungrier for more books. I didn't feel like there were things that were off limits or things that were above my like, reading level or things that were beneath my reading level. And so I would go to the library and like, clear a shelf, throw it in a bag, and take it home and read it. And it was fantastic. So as you look back on your career, the thing, was there a role model that you actually had? Was there somebody that actually helped you along the way? Or was it just a matter of writing and just keep writing? Was there one person really helped you get to where you are now or not really? I always think there's a lot of somebodies. You know, I think everybody always wants to hear like there's like one mentor, one role model. There were so, there are many interesting teachers, interesting people, um, interesting examples of what could be done. Mostly I think I was really fortunate to be raised by amazing parents who truly both cleared a path, like I always say like they were my personal gladiators, they did not allow anybody to allow me to believe I couldn't achieve anything, no matter what. And do they ever call you and say, well, this show wasn't as good as the previous one, or you should do that? they ever give you any of those constructive criticisms? I don't know if 
they call them criticisms. My parents are honest about what they like and what they don't like. They, I don't think they'd ever say any of the shows aren't good. But my mother will say, like, I like this one better than this one, but she would never say that she doesn't think something is good. They're, they're like my biggest cheerleaders, but they're also like, they're your parents. You know what I mean? Like they're very, um, they're responsible for like all of my qualities that make me feel competitive and the qualities that make me feel proud of myself and my confidence. They truly believe in me. So you obviously must believe somewhat in the American dream because you've come from, uh, you know, modest circumstances and you've risen up to this great uh, success. So how do you look at America as a country where people can do things and how do you deal with the challenges we still have and you look at all the problems and so forth? I think that there is definitely an American dream and I think the American dream is supposed to belong to all of us. I don't know that it currently always belongs to all of us and that there are many things that can be done to make that more possible for everybody. And I think the biggest problem is that a lot of people don't believe the American dream belongs to everyone. They think it belongs to some people. Um, and that there's just stuff that can be done to make that more true for everyone. So when you ultimately retire 50 years from now or something like that, um, what would you like to look back and see as your legacy? What would you like to say, this is what I did with my life and have people say about you? Ask me in 50 years. 50 I have no years, idea. okay. All right, well, I would say um, you've done a terrific job of creating a lot of uh, shows that people really enjoy. I highly recommend your book. Uh, to anybody that wants a very good read. And I want to thank you for giving a lot of people a lot of uh, um, entertainment and a lot of things to think about and being a great role model for a lot of Americans. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.